After his proposal of a gas tax holiday to cut gas prices met with blistering criticism as a gimmick, John McCain today shifted away from gimmickry and on to cash prizes. And our third story tonight, for the first time to come up with an alternative to gas guzzlers, the new McCain jackpot is now $300 million. That's $300 million. Specifically, McCain today proposed that $300 million bounty for inventing a new Flash Gordon-y car battery. Where will he ever get the money? We can afford $233 million on a bridge. We certainly could, in my view, uh, spend $1 per every man, woman, and child in America to eliminate uh, our needs. Uh, I could pay for it by canceling three pork barrel projects that are unnecessary and unwanted. And unspecified. McCain not explaining how there's any pork left to spend, since he's already said eliminating pork would pay for his previous spending, and didn't say when this would alleviate gas prices, neither. But virtually as he spoke, both a hedge fund manager and an oil company advisor told Congress today the U.S. could cut the price of crude oil, and therefore gasoline, in half in about 30 days by eliminating legal loopholes that let investors speculate on oil prices. The White House today downplayed the role of speculators, while the McCain camp claimed uh, that he has taken the lead against speculation, a claim the Obama camp suggests is tenuous, given McCain economic guru Phil Graham's role in creating those very loopholes. The McCain camp today releasing a letter from Graham denying any role in writing the legislation, possibly not the best way to deny that it was, in fact, written by lobbyists. At this point, let's bring in Chris Hayes, Washington editor of The Nation magazine. Chris, thanks for your time again tonight. Thank you, Keith. So uh, his offshore drilling is not going to uh, cut prices currently or in the near term. And, and if the invention, invention occurred tonight of the Wonder Battery, that would still be like, I don't know, uh, 2018 maybe. So his position on gas prices is, I have no idea what to do about gas prices? <clears throat> Yeah, that's pretty much it. And, and, and actually, to be fair, I mean, the fact of the matter is it's very unclear what the President of the United States from either party or either candidate could do about gas prices. I mean, right now, the American people, people who live in exurbs particularly, who are very dependent on their cars, are kind of bearing the brunt of, of decades of bad policy. So it's really unclear what the President could do. What you don't want to do, however, is use the kind of proximate crisis of these spiking gas prices to smuggle in a lot of bad policy. So we had the gas tax holiday, holiday was the first idea, and that, that, that would have been a really bad policy. That's been knocked down. And then last week it was offshore drilling, which is also a terrible idea. In fact, one economist said to me that it was like digging for a change in your couch when you're six months behind the mortgage. So, so what, what the one thing you want, don't want to do in sort of the face of a crisis, and that crisis is very real, is use it to sort of throw all sorts of bad policies at the wall. And that seems to be kind of what they're, the, the road they've been going down. Well, if the president can't do anything directly about the price of gas, uh, the, the, the way this is rippling throughout the economy, United Airlines today furloughed 14 1,400 employees, um, and some of the 1,400 are on military leave, just to twist the knife a little bit further. D does McCain have any explanation for how he would, uh, could, could address those ripples? No. One of the problems with his campaign right now is that it's very schizophrenic when it comes to the economy. I mean, he's trying to negotiate this tricky uh, a sort of uh, slithering between the rock, the proverbial rock, and the hard place. On, the, on one side, the rock is the fact that American people are very anxious about the economy, and they have every reason to be between gas prices and the, the, the roiling of financial markets, the subprime crisis, mortgages, foreclosures, etc. And then on the other side, he's got a, a kind of conservative orthodoxy that he has had to kind of embrace in the run-up to this, this campaign in order to get the nomination, that conservative orthodoxy says, well, you can't do a whole heck of a lot. So what ends up happening is that you have this strange kind of schizophrenia. One day he's saying, I support cap and trade, for instance, to deal with global warming. The next day he says, I don't believe in mandatory caps. Well, well mandatory caps are the whole purpose of cap and trade. You know, one day he's, he's, the, he's the budget hero. He's going to fight pork and spending. The next day he's got $300 million for, for a prize. Now, that might be good policy or might not, it might not be. And, and that can be said of, of a number of the things they proposed along the way. But there's absolutely no coherence to what what kind of vision they're laying out for how how they're going to kind of move the economy forward. Yeah, the world opens anew every day for them on this subject. And you and I have yes. talked before about McCain and this Enron loophole, and it became a law thanks to Phil Graham, who is now McCain's chief economic advisor. It was lobbied for by Charlie Black, who is his chief strategist, and is, as we already know, unfortunately, the guy who sees the polit political advantage of a terrorist attack in this country for his party. What happens to McCain? On the, the big picture here, if suddenly the voters or a lot of them connect the Graham, uh, Black, McCain, $4 gas dots. 
Well, it's trouble. And, and what we're seeing in the polls so far is that the voters do trust Barack Obama on energy, the environment, and the economy far more than they trust John McCain. And I think what, what, you're, what you have here is a situation in which, look, people, economists themselves don't really understand why we've seen this spike immediately. People certainly don't. They know they're paying more, right? What you do know is that when you're electing a president, you're, that president is going to bring with them certain voices they're going to listen to and certain interests that are going to have their ear. And we've seen what eight years of an energy policy run by the energy companies has resulted in, and that has not been progress. And so uh, that's, that's the, the perception that they're going to have to battle. Chris Hayes, Washington editor for The Nation. As always, Chris, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Keith. Counting.